Christ be with you. And but also, also with you. So delighted that we can be here together on this seed celebration of the birthday of the church. We call it Pentecost. And the invitation to wear red last week has come to fruition. So thank you for those of you who wore red. Uh, I was going to wear a red hat, and then I realized it would give me a bad hair day. So. Yeah, I guess so. And uh, also um, want to let those who are joining uh, by Zoom and Facebook that we have had what we would call intermittent Wi-Fi connectivity issues this morning. So uh, we're not exactly sure how the service will go or how long you'll be able to join via Zoom or whether you'll get a stream of consciousness sermon for me <laughs> that I can't share my slides. So uh, this is one of those, we are going to trust that like on the first Pentecost, God's Holy Spirit will be poured out upon us and we'll be able to understand each other in our own native languages, which may or may not involve technology, but I hope it does for those of you who are joining from home. I would invite those of you who are here in the sanctuary, if you would stand and join with me in the responsive call to worship. Together, God in the beginning, your spirit brooded over the water and you created everything. By your spirit, spirit you created us anew. And, and we praise you. you. Loving Christ, when you rose from the dead, you breathed your spirit into us. By your spirit, you raised us up from death. And, and we, we thank, thank you. you. Holy Spirit, you breathe your love into us and give us your beauty and your courage. In, In your spirit, you make us one body, the body, the body of Christ, the body, body of love. In, In your spirit, we bear your love to the world. We love you, we worship you, we serve you. Hallelujah. And our opening hymn, if you want to use the hardback hymnal, is number 267, Come, O Spirit, Dwell Among Us. So let's join together uh, with this hymn. <clears throat>
Pour out your spirit on us now and make us once again the body of Christ, breathing your love on fire with courage, carried on the winds of your joy. Speak your word to us and set our heart aflame with your love. Amen. Amen. Let's join together with the responsive affirmation of faith. Here we go. Where it's bold, I would invite you to respond. We give thanks for the spirit of God that lives in us. Since, Since the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in us, then the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to our mortal bodies also through that spirit that lives in us. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And, and the fruit, fruit of the Spirit, Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let us all, since we live by the Spirit, let, let us, us also be guided, guided by the Spirit. The Spirit. Amen. This morning, our scripture reader is George Patch, and he's going to be reading the story from the second chapter of the book of Acts of that first accounting of what happened on the day the church was born. The biblical account of the birthday of the church is found in the book of Acts. Today, it is all about the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost, a Jewish harvest festival 50 days after Passover, the Spirit enables the disciples to tell of God's mighty deeds to people in many different languages. In explaining the event to the crowd, Peter quotes the prophet Joel concerning how God's Spirit will be poured out on all people, men and women, old and young, rich and poor. Hear now to the first 21 verses from the second chapter of Acts. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Lamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of liberty belonging, I'm sorry, the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, 
and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. This was the day that was 50 days after Pentecost, uh, after Passover, that the Jewish community celebrated, and it was a major pilgrimage. And this is something um, that the Christian, some of our Christian traditions have emphasized pilgrimage. But you have to remember that this was a call for anybody who was Jewish to come from anywhere in the world to make their way to the temple. And this was one of three great pilgrimages. So that's why all these people were gathered around because they were, remember, this was still a Jewish community. And so uh, Pentecost comes from the Greek word, which means uh, 50, or penta, uh, for those of you who enjoyed uh, geometry. And uh, the themes of Shabbat were love, perseverance of faith, and mercy. And of course, it's no coincidence that Peter remembered that Joel had said, then after, afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. <laughs> Galatians, this is Paul now interpreting also this, this understanding of God's spirit being poured out on all flesh. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And then finally, we know from John's gospel that Jesus actually spoke about uh, the, this word that's translated as advocate, also sometimes it's called paraclete. It, in other words, it's the Holy Spirit that Jesus is talking about. The Holy Spirit will come when I'm gone. Uh, and, the, and, and I will send the, God will send the Holy Spirit and you will know that I was representing and revealing the way and the will of God. Okay, who knows what a theophany is? Gene does. Gene does. But she's kind of I, I, that's no fair. It, you might guess that Theo is talking about God and the, the latter part of it is about kind of it being in flesh, like epiphany. So theophanies are when God shows up, when the deity shows up. And it's, it's usually a mystifying, um, awe-inspiring, somewhat terrifying experience. And there are theophanies throughout Scripture. And here's Moses, that's one of the classic ones. The other classic is when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, don't be afraid, Mary, but you're going to bear a son who will be the savior of the world. I can only imagine what a teenage girl would be thinking with such an amazing story being told to her, and yet it, Mary became, this became the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord. And of course, the theophany of Pentecost and uh, people were gathered together and they could not understand completely what was happening, but they knew that God was intimately involved with what was happening. And so there are four major symbols, and I hope you don't get sick of looking at this picture, but I actually think, I love this image. Yep. And I love it for the reasons that the major symbols show up. So the first, the first uh, symbol is the diversity of people that are there. And... Um, you know, an artist can't capture all of the diversity in God's beautiful, created, diverse world, but that kind of gives us some picture, uh, rather than having everybody look like Jewish citizens would have looked at the time of Pentecost. So the other one, the other major symbol, which I've mentioned already, is fire, and you see that all over the place. And you also see the dove, which is up there in the hands, and you can see those hands, which are uh, showing the, the wounds of Jesus, which oftentimes are called stigmata. And so those, this author wove together the four major symbols and elements of Pentecost. So what I love 
is that the diversity of all of God's people um, is present at Pentecost. And, and you know, some of us could get stuck on how it is. So, so basically what's happening is the Galileans are the leaders of the church that have been at, in the temple. So all of these pilgrims are coming and they're coming from different places. And of course, they speak different languages. And the text is saying, for some reason, people from all around the world were able to understand these Galileans, even though chances are pretty good that on their own, they would not be able to speak all of the different languages that were present on that day. So if you have trouble with the notion of how did that happen, I would encourage you to think about the United Nations when people wear headsets. And there's a way, now that's technology, but I happen to think that God, in some way, shape, form, or other, was able to connect with those people so they knew that they belonged together. And what was bringing them together was God's own spirit. And remember, they're, they're good Jews who are remembering that, that Moses was given the law on Mount Sinai. Could it be that this is a new law that's being given to us? Isn't this amazing that it would happen at the same time? And uh, what I think, this, this is a lovely image. I think the grief group is, is using this image, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, the listening heart. Um, so, so what I hear the message for us today from Pentecost is that we are called, like those first gatherers, to be intentional about listening and hearing one another's stories so that there is a sense in which we can connect and we can understand. Now, if you've ever traveled in a foreign country and not been able to speak the language particularly well, my guess is that if the person who speaks the native language that you don't speak if there is a willingness on that person and on your part to connect and communicate, it's amazing what can happen with body language, right? And all kinds of other efforts to connect. Can I get a witness on that? Yeah. Now, why the dove? Well, in the book of Genesis, when the story of the ark and Noah sends a dove out, and first time he sends the dove out, it comes back. And the second time he waits a week and sends it out, and the dove goes out and comes back and has an olive branch. And the third time he sends the dove out, the dove doesn't come back. So in that story, it's saying God will provide even after some horrific event has happened. There is a way in which the dove is a sign of hope and a sign of renewal and a sign of purity. Um, and in Genesis further, um, when God says to Abram, you know, bring me a heifer and a female goat and a ram and a turtle dove and a pigeon. This was translated by those first followers on Pentecost. They were reminded that God was providing for all of the economic status. That's what, these, that's what all of these sacrifices represent. If you were wealthy, you could have a heifer three years old that was perfect. But if you were poor, you could probably afford a dove. So a dove was also a sign of God's graciousness and mercy. And finally... The, there are accounts of Jesus' baptism in all four Gospels. I picked the one from Luke. Um, now, when all the people were baptized, when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. Again, do, do we think that there was a dove that, you know, dropped from the stratosphere and plopped on Jesus' head? I don't know. It could have been that a dove did come and fly on him. I know that there are messages sometimes from animals and birds that remind me of people that I've loved. So I don't know exactly what happened, but what I do know is that the people who were there recognized that this person, Jesus, embodied that kind of mercy and love and purity and faithfulness. The reason I picked Luke, too, is the other three Gospels just focus on Jesus' baptism. 
Luke shows us how important it is that after all the people were baptized, then the spirit, then the dove appeared. Mm. That tells me something very important, that Jesus fit into the community and that Luke wanted to emphasize the fact that, that God's activity had been in the people and then it became even clearer what was happening with Jesus. My son with whom I am well pleased is what the rest of the verse says. So I want to talk a little bit about fire because some of my favorite memories in life have come sitting around a fire, either a campfire at the beach or a campfire while camping or a fire in the granite fireplace, which is the camp that my family's owned for five generations. But, but there's something magical about gathering around fire. It's very primal. Can I got a witness on that? Mm -hmm. Very, very primal. And um, even though it's contributing to uh, climate change, the reality is that the internal combustion engine has done a huge array of good stuff for us for a long period of time. And, just for the engineer types that wanted to see all the pieces of uh, the internal combustion engine. I don't know how it works. I'm just glad that when I push the button on my Toyota, it starts. That's, <laughs> that's right. Um, and of course, most of us, uh, or many of us, have our homes heated probably and cooled and our hot water heated because of the fire from natural gas. So there, there are these blessings of fire. But there are also dangers of fire. And I can remember when I was a little kid, even though my dad taught me how to build a fire, um, Smokey the Bear was, was on TV a fair amount. I don't know if any of you, if any of you remember Smokey the Bear being, but it was like, don't play with matches. Mm -hmm. And my dad and Smokey drove that into my head so that every time I thought about starting a fire, I looked at the match in my hand and knew that this could bring warmth it could bring uh, the, the kind of the aesthetic, but it's also dangerous, and you can't. You, you just have to be careful because danger, fire, you know, can burn you. And we don't have to think too long uh, about last summer and the ways in which uh, drought has caused uh, these horrendous wildfires in Oregon and in Washington, Alaska, and California. Um, so, so fire has this interesting. Uh, split personality about it. Um, so I want to just give you an example of blessing and danger united. So the prophet Malachi says, I'm sending a messenger to prepare the way for the Lord, for he is like a refiner's fire and like a washer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Now, this is a text that has been used as a fire and brimstone text. But there's another way to look at it. What the hearers of Malachi would have been thinking about is, is the kind of alchemy that was, was present in that time. That in order to get something that was pure, you had to really put it under a tremendous amount of heat. Say any, I mean, we've kind of lost the, uh, the art of the blacksmith, but you'll remember that in, in earlier times, the only way to form a metal was to get it extremely, extremely hot. So the refiner's fire can actually be seen in a positive way because I don't know about you, but there are parts of my life, even as I'm, pushing into my 60s that I would just as soon have refined with a fire. So they go away. So they're burned. Can I get a witness on that? Yep. Anybody else got some crud they'd like to burn? <laughs> so I grew up in down East Maine and I remember being stunned as a little boy when at the end of the blueberry harvest, uh, people would burn their fields. Oh, yeah. And I remember saying to my dad, this, this makes absolutely no sense. Why would you burn these fields? And he said, because once they're burned, they have to lie fallow for the next season. But the season after that, they'll produce even more berries. Called thermal pruning. I can do with a little thermal pruning. Yeah. <laughs> right? 
This is a picture from Kenya. And it's hard to see in that picture, but those are all illegal rifles, weapons. Wow. And they're burning them. And I can't help but think there is a Pentecost message with fire mm -hmm. and the way in which we have to, as followers of Jesus, respond to this madness. We are a sick culture addicted to violence, especially young men whose brains have not formed and will not form until they're 25 or 30 years old. I know this, I am one of them myself, and I who have been through this. So I hope that you will, I will stand firm on my belief that God asks us to protect and be advocates for the most vulnerable. When did I feed you? When did I protect you? When did I clothe you? When did I give you food? When did I help keep you safe in school? When you did it to the least of these, my sisters and brothers, and I would add siblings. I'm ready for a little refiner's fire when it comes to assault weapons. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. Finally, stigmata. Those hands coming down, it's, it's, it's essentially showing that this is the resurrected Christ. Yes, he was crucified. Yes, he hung on a cross. And yes, he is still alive with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so stigmata is a sign of Jesus' willingness to put aside his own preferences, his own personal safety, what he wanted. You'll remember when he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, God, if, if this cup could pass me by, please... He put his own personal stuff aside for the well-being of the whole. And as a follower of Jesus, it means that we have to be putting individual rights into the context of the well-being of the whole of creation. When individual rights threaten the safety of the innocent and vulnerable, a follower of Jesus must advocate for justice and peace. Is there some agreement in here on this? Absolutely. You can clap if you want to. I mean. <laughs> and let me say that I am a gun owner. And I understand that there are proper uses of guns. I grew up in a culture, the family next door to me lived off the land, they hunted every animal. They yeah. That was how gun safety worked in the culture I grew up in. Yeah. And if you killed something and you ruined it because you took a bad shot, you would hear about it because you just wasted valuable meat. That's the sacredness of firearms is knowing how dangerous they can be. And yes, they can put food on the table. And yes, they can be fun. And yes, yes, and... I'm willing to let go of the privilege to fire an automatic weapon if it means kids in school are safer. Amen. Yes. So here are some points to ponder. Which symbol of Pentecost? Diversity, fire, dove, sacrifice? Which of those symbols speaks to you most clearly at this point in your life? Maybe more than one. Maybe none of them. Maybe one jumps out at you. And in what ways does Bethel need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Or to put it another way, how is the Holy Spirit birthing something at Bethel from your perspective? What, 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 what needs to be birthed here at Bethel? This is the birthday of the church. And do you sense the Holy Spirit calling you in a way that contributes to the well-being as the prophet Joel said, all flesh. This is what's absolutely fascinating. When Richard Rohr wrote his book about the universal Christ, it's rooted in a prophet who's been 2,500 years or more old who said God is going to pour out God's spirit on all flesh. 
And that's exactly what we as Christians believe about Jesus and about us as carriers, as conduits, as places for the Spirit to dwell, to make the place that we live in much, as much as it can be as God would have. So my friends, be strengthened by the faith because this is a day where we celebrate mercy, perseverance of faith, and the power of love. And the people were heard to say, Amen. Amen. pray for the leaders, the national leaders of our, the world powers and those countries that oftentimes are pushed aside and need to fight for a voice. And we pray for all of those who struggle for basic necessities of clean water and safe shelter. Some of them we know in poorer countries around the globe and others we know as we see them sleeping on the streets here in Beaverton and in Portland. Help us to at least see them and recognize them and do what is within our power to make those challenges of human decency to meet them and meet those needs. We lift up our our sister church, Ainsworth United Church of Christ in Portland, and their pastor, Lynn Smaus Lopez. We lift up also our conference minister, Tyler Conley. Finally, O oh God, we, we pray for whatever need it is that we may, we may have this day. Wherever there is a hurt or wherever there is discomfort or whether it's physical or spiritual or emotional and we pray O oh God for the trust to let your refiners fire burn in us and cleanse us of those chains that may keep us from being the complete whole human you envision and invite us to be. Knit us together now, O oh God, with that prayer the first disciples asked their rabbi Jesus and he responded, here's a prayer. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have the opportunity to hear our choir. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. And on this day of Pentecost, we remember that when Jesus gathered the disciples together before he died, he knew that they were going to be incredibly stressed out as we can be incredibly stressed out by the world in which we find ourselves. And in his wisdom... And as we have learned as churches, that when you gather people around food, there is a bond that happens. So this is a very simple meal, but as we eat and as we gather around these familiar words, it connects us with those who've gone on before us and with God's own Holy Spirit as it was revealed to us in Jesus who became for us the Christ. So we remember that when, when Jesus gathered those disciples together at Passover, he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to them and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. body of Christ broken for you.
Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we give thanks that you have fed us, that you abide with us, that you dwell in us, and that you equip us for living lives of fullness, of mercy, and of love. In the name and in the spirit of Jesus we pray. Amen. This is an opportunity for you to support the work, the ministry, the mission of our church. This is the opportunity to give. And um, if you've been here before, you know the drill. You can either leave a gift uh, at either of the offering plates that you'll find on your way out either door. You can also um, mail a check if you'd like. And uh, you can go to our website and there's an opportunity to give. So I hope that you will be able to do that um, so that we can continue being a voice, a progressive voice in a community that needs to hear the values of love and mercy, graciousness, and how beautiful this great diverse world has been created by God. So, um, Chad, let's do the doxology. My guess is most of you will know the words without the slides. Oh, you got them. I ain't got them, but I know them. <laughs> Stand, if you will, please. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God for all that love has done, Creator, Christ, and Spirit, One. Amen. And do you have a prayer of dedication? Together, let us pray. Gracious God, we give you our gifts as symbols of our lives. Receive them with love. Bless them with grace and use them according to your will. Anoint us with your spirit. Unite us with all who love you. Give us the language of grace and send us into the world aflame with your love. In the name of Christ, for the sake of the blessing of the world. Amen. My friends, your blessing to whoever you encounter. Trust that God's Spirit will give you the strength, the courage, the patience, the wherewithal to be a presence in the world that will give glory to God. Not every time, but most of the time, this is our dream, and together we can support one another. And the people were heard to say, Amen. <laughs>